thank you very much for being with us. Um, obviously, this conversation uh, today and the conversations we've been having over the last years have been so much dominated by a war in Europe about challenges in the East. Uh, and that's completely natural, of course. Um, but they're not the only ones, obviously. And we've had events recently that remind us of some of the risks, uh, the very real ones, whether we're talking about the, the war in Gaza or uh, the situation with maritime security in the Red Sea, uh, or we're talking about the recent Iranian uh, attack on Israel, or a lot of other things that we've been thinking about for some time. Now, I mean, in, in a sense, this is a, this is a, a question with a long history at NATO, but also for the European Union. Uh, different neighborhoods, different strategies, maybe not always equivalent, uh, episodic, but if you look over the long sweep of the last decades, uh, maybe not always existential, but probably many more security crises emanating from the South than from, from the East. Again, not existential perhaps in the same way, although politically existential for some governments. So that's, that's the starting point for our, for our conversation uh, today. But maybe if, if I could, Anna, maybe to start with you, if you'll, you'll allow me. Um, you were um, actually, uh, you're a great expert on this, but you're also uh, the perfect person to have with us because you were the chair of a recent, um, recently completed, I suppose, um, a study commissioned by uh, NATO, an experts, independent experts group, uh, to study exactly this problem in its different dimensions. And I know it has a lot of conclusions, but maybe just say a little bit about, you know, in, in some couple of brief words, what you found. Uh, thank you for the invitation and, and for being here. Uh, the report is very, uh, very interesting because it was made by the group of 11 people from different allies with different perceptions about the way that NATO should engage with the different neighborhoods. But I will say that one of our main, if I can say conclusions, but I think um, it's very important, is about the mindset. And the mindset is or we go east or we go south, it's not, uh, it's like a zero-sum game, and it's not like that. Uh, uh, when we discuss uh, NATO's approach to the southern neighborhoods, normally uh, the, the understanding is to have uh, closest relations, we need to give up of something in the east. And we use the, the, the idea of 360 approach just as a narrative to apply to all allies, but it's not truth. And, and, and uh, the practicalities and the, 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 the threats shows that really the 360 approach to the three core tasks, dissuasion, crisis management, and uh, uh, collective security, are very important. You have Africa Corps in, in, in Africa, and particularly in the case of Sahel, that substitute uh, uh, Wagner. Uh, Russia, uh, Russia has, for decades, but now with a different uh, approach, very close relation with the military elites in, in African countries. They have uh, trade on military industry with North Africa, Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa countries. And we have Iran uh, uh, giving drones to Russia to be applied in Ukraine. So if, we, if the reality does not show us the complete and close link between South and East, I really don't know how much obvious that, that could be. And, and the second thing that uh, um, our report and, and the way that we like to, to show that to, to, to NATO and to allies, it's about narratives and echo chambers. That means that NATO has its own narrative uh, that do not deal with the very negative perceptions that this narrative creates outside NATO echo chambers. This is not so different from the EU. The negative perceptions come from double standards, and not only double standards on conflicts, but double standards on the way partners are treated. You have relations with Eastern or, or uh, global partners as Korea or Japan that you do not have with Southern partners. Uh, you have the idea of NATO as a military uh, uh, alliance where uh, uh, people do not distinguish between NATO and the United States, NATO and France, NATO and United Kingdom. For them, it's exactly the same. 
and uh, uh, NATO is not known. People do not know what NATO do, what NATO can do, how NATO decide, and uh, uh, it's very difficult to prepare a narrative and a storytelling where you do not understand who listens to you. And this is our major message to NATO. No, thank you very much for that. And Stefano, I want to come back to, to take a little bit of the, the European Union perspective on this in the neighborhood, but maybe because it follows very closely from what Anna was just saying, General Scaparotti, if, if we just reflect yeah. from your experience as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, uh, how you thought about the balance between well, these theaters? Well, I was a Supreme Allied Commander. We, we nearly completed work on the a new military strategy for the defense of the transatlantic region. It was completed by Walters uh, in that year after I left. We did that primarily to have a 360, a defense of the transatlantic area. And that's what the DDA is, the Deterrence and Defense of the Transatlantic AOR, specifically because it bothered me that we looked at east, south, north, and west, and that was always the tug why I was the SACUR, when in reality we knew that it's all connected. And even today, the point I would make is we talk about the strategy in the South. The principles of that are already established in the DDA, which we had never had before. And whatever steps are taken to reinforce the South and its defense, it must be nested in that greater transatlantic strategy. But it's beautiful that we have that today. Now, it's classified, so most folks don't know that, and it's not talked about as much but it was specifically because of what she said, and both, both of her points resonate with me. Okay. Stefano. The European Union has faced in its own way uh, similar challenges, different instruments, different issues in, in some respects, but also has a lot of, has a lot of um, very relevant instruments in the South. As a, as a strong, you have strong political relationships on a north-south basis, there are uh, very strong aid relationships, commercial relationships, in many ways the key relationships for many of these uh, countries in the south are in fact with Europe, not with the, their neighbors. Um, how, do you, how have you thought about this problem uh, in your role uh, of how you, how you approach the southern neighborhood and whether it needs to be somehow reinvented? Well, first, first of all, I mean, I, I would add the, the security dimension, I mean, because it's, it is true that the, uh, NATO um, uh, is a key uh, uh, player uh, from that point of view, but it's also true that the security has become a much broader context, much broader concept, sorry, in uh, uh, recently, and, it, and the, all the instrumentalization of policies, cyber attacks, um, uh, uh, disinformation, and all elements which are coming in very strong. So there is already, there is there a very strong dimension which is also covering these aspects. And then there is a, um, a thinking about um, how to turn uh, this region into a, um, a partner, an economic partner, a partner that can share with us a, a vision of what we can do together. And especially uh, in, uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of years, I would say, we have focused enormously on the uh, 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 capacity of these countries to grow. Um, and through this, um, also allow them to uh, um, uh, tackle some of their own social problems. And energy has become for us a little bit the key element uh, of the uh, work that we are doing in, uh, uh, in this region. Um, they are naturally uh, um, either for some steel with um, um, hydrocarbon, but also for uh, clean energies. And there is there are very interesting projects that we are trying to develop with them in order to interconnect much more the, uh, this region to, uh, uh, to the European Union. So I would say, uh, uh, and then I mean I cannot hide, and I can, I'm, I'm not going to do that. There is also a component of control of migration, which is part of, uh, uh, of this story. So I would say that along the, all those lines, we are trying to uh, develop a, a, a quite intense partnership. We have seen uh, with, uh, um, not everybody was completely happy, but uh, with, uh, with Tunisia first, then with Egypt, and we are trying now to, to broaden uh, uh, these partnerships uh, into a, a more structured, in a more structured form. Um, maybe the last thing that uh, I would say that the uh, um, 
we have a tailor-made approach, so it's not something, it's not one size fits all. Uh, the reality are very, and realities of the countries are very different. Um, and so we are trying to adjust and to adapt uh, to the different realities. But again, we are trying also to uh, develop a, a, a relationship which is based on shared interests and try to translate into reality what we have always said, in a, a partnership among equals. So if we look across this region, I mean, you could posit that one of the things that makes this very difficult in strategic terms is that unlike the situation in the East where it's very challenging because of its scale and because you have a very a sort of pointed threat uh, against which you can plan deterrence, defense, and so on, uh, it's very clear what the problem is in a way. Um, in the South, you have this vast geography with these diffuse, sometimes very serious, but very diverse and diffuse risks uh, felt in different ways by different allies in different places with different partners uh, and all the rest of it. Um, how do you construct a strategy for a space like this? Or do we even think about it in the same way? Is, is, is the word have a different meaning in this theater? Yeah, I think we did. What I, what I relied upon was uh, whether it's terrorism or, or Russia, etc. They're on a campaign of destabilization. So how do you counter that destabilization? Through counterterrorism, through countercriminal networks, through uh, dealing with migration, et cetera, in the ways that you can, uh, through capacity building, civil works, et cetera. All those things are counters to that destabilization. Um, and so that's the way that, that we thought about it and constructed it. Um, the response to that, though, as you point out, is so diverse that it has to be a comprehensive approach. Most of us look at the military aspect, but it will not succeed if it's not a heavy component of diplomacy, economy, information, etc. And in the South in particular, I thought that the work that we did with the EU was just, it, it was necessary because they're the experts in some of those elements of power. Um, and they also had a more direct approach uh, mm -hmm. to the problems in the South. So we tried to complement them in every way that we could and ensure that we had coupled that thinking because we needed a comprehensive approach. You know, Anna, when you, we, you were kind enough to come and have a conversation with us with your group uh, some months ago when you were working on this mm -hmm. study, uh, and one of the things that emerged from that was... Um, the fact that uh, we were talking about NATO, but I think it's probably true for the European Union as well, that there are real assets that these institutions have in the South. I mean, if you think about the problem in the East where you've had to rebuild in a massive capacity for defense and response and demand structure and all of these things, in the South, all of that is still there. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, you have partnerships that are very effective. You've got a lot of c capability, in fact, that's in the South. Commands, all of this. And the European Union, for its part, of course, has, has a lot of resources that are devoted uh, to the South. You don't necessarily have to reinvent them. I mean, do, is, is that significant? I mean, that you, you start with these assets. You don't have to necessarily find a lot of new ones. You find that in the South? Is that what you... Exactly, yeah. exactly. Because uh, um, when you look to, to the South and we use the expression of neighborhoods, we are talking about very different uh, areas yeah. from North Africa to the Middle East. And here the Gulf is different from the, the great Mediterranean that has the, the, the North African Middle East. We have Sahel, we have Sub-Saharan Africa, and we have the maritime areas as the, the, the Red Sea. And and um, normally, uh, when we talk about NATO and the South, we talk about threats and risks. We never talk about opportunities. And the, this question of opportunities, already with NATO's uh, uh, know-how and the way that is applying on training, on uh, uh, capacity building, on institutional building in the context of the armed forces and uh, the relation between civil and military. This is very important and uh, especially when you, and you need to talk and you need to engage with the youth because you are talking with the continent in the case of Africa but also in the case of Middle East in some countries 
countries that's going to be demographically the more young country, uh, young continent in the next decades. So if you establish always the same relation with the same elites and with the same partners, that means that you are losing what's really going to happen. So uh, uh, besides the question of training and, and capacity building, Science for Peace, for example, is a great project that NATO has on technology that is very appealing for uh, the southern countries. And beside all that, that uh, you referred, I think maritime security, resilience in critical infrastructures, and proliferation. We need to talk about proliferation because partners, specifically in the Middle East and Gulf, are very worried about nuclear yeah. proliferation. And NATO is the gold standard for all this. So if you don't use this, politically it's a, a mistake because you lose the South, you leave the South, to the others, that's what you have, have been done in the last decade, at least. And if you leave, someone's going there. Russia and China are there very differently, but they are completely there. So, so a, a rather basic question. We're talking about the South, and you use a, a better frame, in, uh, frames, I should say, in, mm -hmm. in your report where you talk about a set of Southern neighborhoods, I believe, um, which are slightly different. But, 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 you know, how far South is South, in a sense? I mean, um, are we, you know, I, I, we're clearly we're talking about the Mediterranean, we're talking about the Levant, we're talking about North Africa, and the, but also the Sahel. Uh, what about the rest of Africa? What about, you know, what, what is the, the Atlantic South? What, what is the, what's the relevant frame here, you know? When we talk about the East, we sort of know what we're talking about. Yeah. It, um, it's a relevant question because I was realizing that while the conversation was going on that I, I was my interpretation of the south was really the southern neighborhood so it was really the north right. Mediterranean and maybe a little bit the, uh, the Middle East region which is completely different also a completely different region so if we speak of the south in broader terms uh, that involves all the African continent the broader Middle East then we have I mean uh, it, it's very difficult to uh, make everything in a single bag, eh, to put says, everything in a single bag, because the, the realities are extremely di different. I could say that, for example, uh, for the, um, um, in, in all the Middle East, uh, one of the most interesting things that we are trying to do is this new um, connectivity corridor, uh, IMEC, that from India goes through the Middle mm -hmm. East and to, uh, uh, to Europe. Um, if I have then to go really broad uh, in terms of uh, embracing uh, the whole uh, uh, idea of the South or Global South, however you want to call it, um, then the, uh, the, 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 the main instrument that we have developed in, uh, in, in this last couple of years is uh, a Global Gateway. It's essentially a redefinition of the way we work with third countries um, and we are uh, trying to define connectivity uh, um, uh, projects so both in the energy but also in digital or even in material connectivity to try to uh, link again all these countries with the European Union in equal partnerships mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, projects. And there is also a broader effort that we are trying to uh, make with all the countries of the South, but again, it's a very, very, very broad concept, um, by which we are trying to uh, define a common agenda based on common interests that can overcome the, uh, uh, let's say, the more traditional donor-recipient uh, uh, model that we have used for, uh, for many years. But again, I mean, I honestly, I would try to, um, to think in, in, in more specific terms because otherwise we run the risk of, uh, because what is applicable in the Sahel is certainly not applicable, not even in the Horn of Africa. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's based on understanding today. You have to understand your environment. And what we used to call our area of interest, which was what was beyond my area, which was really the shore of northern Africa, that area of interest has expanded greatly with today's technology, information, mm -hmm. speed of information. One of the things you'll recall is we established the hub in the south. Right. Well, part of that was to get a better understanding of the south. And through that, we connected with shipping companies, insurance companies, uh, heavily into customs, etc. Because it's that network of networks that you find out things on a strictly military intelligence scale we didn't understand. Right. 
but we could understand it through that. It was really uh, somewhat of an eye-opener. And, and secondly, I would say, when you're dealing with criminal elements, which much of this is, I mean, they move people, they move mm -hmm. weapons, they move whatever for the money, um, you often don't find that by tracking one line of intelligence or information. It's usually a collection from multiple countries that gives you enough of the tips for us to be successful and track a problem to where we can take action. And so it required that network. So all of that was a part of that hub and coupling that with what was traditional military intelligence. I mean, obviously, the, in, in a sense, the three of you look at this from slightly different but complementary, I think, angles. I mean, you had mentioned the connectivity uh, projects that, uh, you know, where the private sector and others have to, these projects have to be bankable. And to be bankable, they have to be uh, securable. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we see in the Red Sea now, whether you're talking about subsea cables or maritime or shipping uh, or ports, um, that's not easy. And maybe it's getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously, if Hezbollah wanted to do what uh, the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea, they have much more capability to do it, in fact. You know, less confined space, maybe. But, I mean, is maritime security per se, and I know you identify this in the report, uh, going to be one of the drivers of, of strategy for, for states, but also for institutions engaged in the South? Well, you know, essentially, a vital interest for us all is freedom of navigation and the ability to move trade and economy. And that's becoming much and much more difficult because of the reach of weapons systems, et cetera. I mean, you can, you can be the Houthis and you're not even a state government. You know, you're an entity out there that has the wherewithal to, to find the best technology and harness it. You have drones today that make these things extremely difficult. And you have a threat under sea that's mm -hmm. becoming more and more sophisticated. So all of those things make the maritime environment and gaining maritime awareness very difficult mm -hmm, today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you see it, Stefan? Yeah, I mean, uh, ab absolutely. I mean, it's, if you think of the, uh, the, the maritime, the undersea, the, uh, um, the space, the outer space, are the new frontiers. Eh? I mean, it's, uh, certainly it's the, the, um, uh, the interconnections, the cables, but also the, uh, the satellites. So it's the, uh, the, and there is no regulation that, we, uh, that mm -hmm. we have in place. So in a way, it's, uh, um, and it's something that is worries us a lot because I mean, all the, uh, the new technologies goes through this kind of interconnections. So uh, the protection uh, of this, this is one of the, by the way, this is one of the projects that we have in common with NATO eh, on the protection of critical infrastructures, which is huge uh, undertaking. But the, um, uh, the idea of maritime security has become a central, I would say, in, uh, in the work that, uh, that we are doing. We have started very, very modestly, eh, in a very modest way, just trying to uh, have a coordinated maritime presence of our member states, although our member states have ships that go around the world constantly, uh, trying to uh, just to simply uh, make it sure that uh, they are not uh, at the same place at the same time altogether, but they, uh, they are, uh, uh, let's say, trying to fix a sort of calendar. Mm -hmm. In the presence, this is already uh, uh, assuring a quite significant um, um, impact on uh, um, uh, in certain regions. We have tested in the Gulf of Guinea, we have you know, done some work in the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific Ocean. So there are already, uh, let's say, and, and we are developing this kind of approach also to uh, other um, uh, specific regions. And we have started also working concretely uh, with uh, um, our main uh, security partners also in terms of joint exercise. I'm a little bit, uh, let's say, very modest when mm. uh, we speak about that, but we have had the first joint exercise with the United States, and we are now trying to develop the same with Japan. What about Russia? In the, I mean, we talked about this glancingly in the beginning in, in terms of showing that these were not separate theaters, that they were somehow connected in security terms, and there are a lot of connections. Um, but maybe to say a little bit more about that. I mean, how seriously should we take uh, kind of the, 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 the part of this risk equation that comes from Russia in the South, whether it's through proxies or arms sh transfers or uh, political interference. I mean, there are a lot of things that we could talk about, uh, but uh, is this overblown? Is it real? How do you see it? Well, all the interactions that we have with uh, regional partners 
and listening to partners and listening to uh, representatives of the political communities give us a very concrete idea that uh, the potential of Russia creating stability uh, in the Sahel, well, that is already uh, a fact, so <laughs> we, we don't need, but if we go uh, to sub-Saharan Africa and if you go also to parts in the North Africa, uh, you have exactly the same recipe that is direct contact with the, the communities, having uh, 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 disinformation working against the enemies, and then you weaponize. You weaponize uh, migration flows, you weaponize food, you weaponize access to basic resources as water, and uh, you simply have the potential of creating instability. But if you allow me to go to maritime security, ve a very concrete no, no, point. It was the second, uh, uh, and, and probably in parallel with uh, uh, counterterrorism, need and common interest identified by the partners. Example, illegal fishing with coastal states where China is stealing the fish that is related with the survival of the population and is an income for the local population. And China is doing that. The, the, the countries, the coastal states in Africa do not have the possibility to respond. And there is a way that NATO and the EU can help. Infra, uh, uh, the uh, undersea cables, we can stop to have internet. Sure. So uh, uh, I think there is no lack of information about this. Who controls the ports? Who can do the protection of critical uh, infrastructures? And this is a very concrete measures that in the short and, and medium term, uh, this case of illegal, uh, of illegal fishing and capacity building on these states is deeply related with development because people are going to get their money to survive fishing every day and they cannot uh, uh, confront Chinese presence in their seas. And, and this is a uh, uh, win-win, let's say, uh, uh, position. So from, from both a NATO and a European Union point of view, when you have discussions with, with partners in the southern neighborhood, um, what do they complain about? I mean, uh, we've done some studies on this too, and one of the first things they say is, well, you know, we're, we're more than happy to partner with you in these areas and so on. First of all, where are the resources for it? But also, what is your strategy? You know, they ask, what is the strategy? We want to know what we're getting ourselves into, in a sense, with the partnership. <coughs> I mean, did you hear that when you went around to... And of yes. course, you had those I, conversations. I, I met uh, uh, yeah. fairly regularly with the countries from the South, and in fact, we were working on a strategy uh, among the nations that included a, a force structure um, and some idea of operations and also crisis management at the time. So this was not a... This was a topic that was very alive, mm -hmm. you know, in 2016 and beyond. Sure. Often what you found then was that we, we did have a very, very much it's either east or south or north kind of zero sum. And it's really not that at all. The entire, every nation has an interest in the south, for instance, and would be a part of whatever that strategy or operation we put together. So that was difficult to convince, you know, it was the SAC year to convince the nations that that's the way we need to look at this. So for the countries from the south, Theirs was resource constraints. Were they going to get help on uh, force structure and capacity and specific skills that they didn't have? And then you had to develop that and convince the other countries that the threat was real for them and that action needed to be taken. And as you know, perceptions of threat across then 29 countries mm -hmm. differs depending on where you sit. Mm -hmm. So that's another aspect of gaining that kind of support in NATO. It can be done, it's done. But I think, again, the strategy that we have today is helpful in that regard. And how do you manage this in an EU context? Um, I, if, I, if I may, I mean, I would like to uh, make a couple of comments. Because I think sure, it's, uh, and then um, uh, coming on now also to your question. Um, what Anna was saying, I mean, I think that the... Um, um, She's absolutely right when she uh, um, describes the way Russia is behaving. And it is, I would say, very typical because the only way Russia can uh, 
stay uh, as a relevant actor in the international scene is by spoiling things. So it's the spoiler by definition. There is no strategy, there is no alternative vision, there is no alternative offer. It's just creating problems, <laughs> essentially. And the only thing that uh, then is offering is protection for local uh, um, uh, juntas or uh, military leadership that have gone to power generally in a quite shaky way. So it's a, um, uh, it's a very typical pattern, eh? uh, and you can see they are applied um, across the board. Um, so it's, it's something that I think that we would need to uh, really to uh, look at, uh, because this has become the way of behaving uh, and their foreign policy uh, uh, pattern. Um, uh, on the point of the, uh, um, um, I think you were rightly saying the, the perception of the threat is not the same. Uh, and that's applicable also to the, uh, our member states. I mean, I always say the perception of the threat is different if you sit in uh, Riga than if you sit in Lisbon. I mean, it's, you have different kind of, uh, uh, of um, perceptions. But that's why, I mean, the effort that we have tried to, uh, and then come to your point, um, uh, Ian, the, uh, the, the effort that we have tried to make is to uh, have a, a, a agreed threat assessment. Because if we are not managing to come to an understanding that the threat is no longer geographically defined, mm -hmm. that there is no longer a European security or an Atlantic security or a Pacific security, but that essentially the concept of security has become one. And what is happening, what you were saying about the legal fishing, or what you were saying, but the same story can go for the uh, South China Sea. Mm -hmm. If tomorrow we have problems in the South China Sea, we have a problem ourselves, because our trade will be disrupted. If there is a problem in the uh, Red Sea, there is a problem for us, because our trade is being disrupted. And uh, so it's, it's very difficult now to say, uh, you know, Russia, only the countries you know, on the eastern flank of NATO are uh, uh, touched by that. Because the, 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 uh, the, the way they are playing their cards, it's much more sophisticated. It's traditional component, and the traditional component, the geography matters. But then there are many other ways of fighting a war. This information, weaponization, weaponization of everything. Exactly. It's, there is not a single element that cannot be weaponized or instrumentalized. Cyber, that's also another point. You, you don't need to be close. Eh? You can do cyber attacks from wherever in the world. So, I mean, it's, um, um, the game has become, unfortunately, much more sophisticated, much more complex. The traditional component has gone up again, so the military, the defense component, we see because now it's uh, the, the issue that we are discussing uh, uh, every day. But at the same time, you have new threats, new challenges that we need to face. I want to open it up to all of you. Uh, we have, I'm conscious of our time, but we have some time. And uh, so please catch my eye, Rita, and <laughs> we will give you the floor. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, have a micro we'll have a microphone for you. And do, do tell us who you are okay. and where you're from. So I'm, my name is Rita Faden. I'm president of the Portuguese American Luso Foundation. And I have a question for Ana Santos Pinto, because I thought it was very interesting interesting when you talked about uh, the relation of NATO and the South and the idea that instead of only thinking about threats, we should only we should also think about opportunities and especially opportunities in what regards young people. And so if I would like if you could expand a bit on that idea. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that goes exactly on the question that Jan made on the complaints. The complaint is not only for money. In our case, the first complaint of all partners in the South was, listen to us. And, and I think this is very important because uh, when we go to, to opportunities, uh, put yourself on the same boots when someone reached to you saying they're coming only threats and risks. 
and not opportunities. And in the case of youth, I think that is must very, very clear uh, when we have disinformation through digital media that goes directly to young people, and we know that young generations are the ones that are most radicalized and polarized in, in the discourse. So uh, um, we, we have some ideas and some recommendation in, in the report uh, uh, regarding youth, uh, because we the political strategy needs to be thought and, and to be proposed in this uh, uh, context of the report on the short, medium and long term. And long term is youth, is youth engaging in, in the discourse and see and understanding uh, if that's the political strategy, they are not only threats, they are not threats, they are uh, uh, opportunities to, to engage with and, and to learn, and that is very connected with the idea of our defense, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, thank you. Len, did you want to come in? You were trying to, you're trying to catch my eye. Well, you know, if I take that while you're looking, six, Absolutely. six another That's of the 260 ten approach when we are here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Six of the ten fastest growing economies are in Africa yeah. right now. And when you have a population that in 15 years will be the largest working age population, that's that too, it's all opportunity if you look at it that way. And also something very interesting is that in the African continent, you have areas that for satellite launch are very special and we need to get there to satellites and to outer space. Uh, uh, and that's an opportunity that I think it also should be taken into account. Okay. Maybe coming Please. in on, on, uh, on, on this point, on, on the listening part, uh, which is a, a very important, uh, um, a very important uh, story. It is true that somehow, but that, that's we have to uh, make a sort of um, a deep analysis. For quite some time, we have gone around saying this is our this is not our model this is the model exactly this is the the uh, the, uh, the our the values were universal values uh, the model was our model and that's one of the uh, big asks now of the south in general now i'm using really the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the world in, in in because they want to have a say in the definition of the governance of the world they want to have a say in the way uh, rights are uh, defined um, one of the interesting things that comes from china um, is exactly this that they are offering alternative models we may disagree but they have an alternative model where they say that the uh, social rights are more relevant than the individual rights, that economic rights are an important part of the uh, uh, rights of the people, that first of all you need to um, um, get out of poverty and then you can think about democracy. Again, we can argue, but there is a reasoning behind it. And that's the, the, the uh, and it's interesting that uh, uh, in uh, the main areas in this of the of the governance and of the uh, the mechanism of the vision, in the area of the financing for development, including for uh, um, the greening of our economies or decarbonization, and on is and issues like migration, we are unable to provide, let's say, proper answers. And that's a little bit the uh, and it's interesting that from that point of view you see. Uh, the BRICS, which is BRICS Plus, which is not um, uh, necessarily a group of countries which shares the same approach and the same political line, but they have, they have this in common. They have in common a request for changes, for um, uh, um, more equity, or as they say, more equity and more justice in, uh, in, uh, in the uh, global world. Yeah. Just over here, if we could. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ilke Teuger, Director of Global Policy Center based in Madrid. It's great to see you again, Ambassador. Actually, I, I will just pick up where you have left. Um, uh, we, I know that we, EU institutions and leaders are talking about EU strategic agenda 2024 moving forward. And I was wondering if there will be a priority or various priorities regarding the South, not just South or neighborhood, but also picking up on your point on the plural South itself and how the EU will position uh, itself moving forward for the next term. Thank you. 
<laughs> I would say that this is our um, uh, main challenge, uh, what we are trying to do. Uh, uh, we have started working on this already some time ago. I mean, after the um, Russian aggression against Ukraine, um, we started analyzing the pattern of votes in the United Nations in the General Assembly, and we were trying to define which were the, the reasons eh, behind certain patterns of votes. And you realize that it's a there is an ideological element here and there, but for many other countries, it was more a question of saying, why all of a sudden now we have to be uh, so attentive about something that touches you, uh, that is relevant for you, but for us, we see only the negative consequences of this in terms of um, energy prices, in terms of uh, um, um, agriculture um, uh, products and so on, prices. Um, and why have you not paid enough attention when we were asking for more attention from you? And that's why I mean the effort that I was trying to uh, describe very briefly about defining a different way of working with these countries, a different offer to give to uh, the, the, these countries, different instruments, different methodology, including this, talking and trying to listen to, not only going there and preaching, and showing that the uh, showing the way, but it's um, how to say it's um, something that uh, we make. If we are at the beginning, eh? if we really want to face in a different way uh, uh, our approach to uh, to the global south, we need to be much bolder from uh, from that point of view, and again, and to be much more à l'écoute eh, of uh, uh, what is coming from uh, from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to your question, too, on NATO's side, it's my understanding that NATO's aspiration is to approve a strategy for the South in this summit coming up in July. So we should look forward to seeing that as well. I, I was just <laughs> speaking on, on, on this, uh, and it was exactly the beginning of uh, our talk. Uh, this is a change of mindset, and we need to realize that the world uh, works differently uh, from our minds. Uh, states in the South are not, uh, they are not going to uh, continue accepting the idea of preaching and they, they really want to be engaged and listen. And we have two options, or we go there or we simply go out. And, and I think that uh, for any strategy, uh, this should be the starting point, that uh, reality check. But mindset changes take a long time in institutions like EU, NATO, or states even though. Yeah. So one Absolutely. of the things about this, I would say, what have we learned about these kinds of uh, problems over the past two decades? And I think one of them I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. what they really need is skills. What we need a lot less of is dollars. Because dollars in many of these places, we flood a region that, that, that it economically is, is, has poverty already. So we do two things. We create dependency, which is the opposite of mm -hmm. what you want mm -hmm. to do. And you usually create corruption because it's just too hard to resist that kind of money going in. So what I think I learned was, let's work on the skills, let's try a different approach, and let's be careful about how, much, how we try to do things by paying for it or by buying it. Because I felt that, at least in, in the areas that I worked in, uh, that money created counter, counters to what we were trying to do. Okay. So my colleagues have told me we have two minutes, uh, which is a little, two minutes more than I thought we had, which is great. So let me come over here. Len, please, we'll get you a microphone. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Len Ishmael. I'm a senior fellow with the Policy Center for the New South, as well as a senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Uh, very, very interesting conversation, but I, I just wanted to stick a pin in here. Uh, the biggest threat for countries of the Global South, usually are not military threats, right? It's a threat about development and economic survival. So. I agree with Anna very, very much. I think it's Anna, yes? yes. yes. Thank you. It's important to listen rather than, I'm, I'm very sorry with all due respect, saying let's not give them too much money because of inflation and let's focus on skills. How about just listening to what they want? Let's I, start a different I agree with that. narrative. <laughs> a different, I would assume the skills are what they need. I'm sorry, <laughs> a, a different means of engagement, yeah. okay? Based less on a post-colonial 
and paradigm, but much more in terms of equity yeah. and partnerships, yeah. which are genuine. Remember, I talked about not creating dependency. Uh, yes, I mean, that, I that means we're listening. <laughs> I, I know, but, <laughs> but I, think, I think that they can speak for themselves. Yeah. They just need to be invited to the table. <laughs> okay, so now thank you for that, and thank you for the answers. Uh, I want to thank you all for really a terrific conversation. Uh, it, it's a diffuse topic, but I think we managed yeah. to pull out of it some more pointed observations, uh, and we're very, very grateful for that. So thank you very, very much. Please join me in thanking all three of our thank speakers. You. General, thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs>